Hey, what's going on folks? Uh, I put out a video yesterday about how I deal with leash reactivity or leash aggression with clients' dogs. And uh, you know, I, I touched on, like I always do, about the things that go on inside the home. How we live with the dog inside the home creates that dog, you know, outside of the home. And so many of you had really specific questions and um, you know, wanted examples of what do I mean? You know, what do I do in this situation? What do I do in that situation? How do we create that relationship inside the home? A lot of different things. So I figure let's talk about one subject that I think can help a, a lot of average dog owners that are struggling a little bit. And it's something that most people have no clue about. And when I say most people, I'm talking about average everyday dog owners. I'm not talking about dog trainers. Although there's a lot of dog trainers out there that struggle with this and don't pay a lot of attention to it, you know? Um, but I think it's something that if the average dog owner starts to really understand a little bit and starts implementing more inside the home, outside the home, you, you see a very, very, um, very big difference very quickly, okay? So let's talk about the use of space how we use space, how the dogs use space, right? Um, really, really important for me. And again, whenever I talk about something like this, guys, I'm just telling you what I do, how I see things. Doesn't mean it's the only way, doesn't maybe even mean it's the best way, but it's what I truly feel and what I believe. And for me, with my own dogs, that behavior in the real world, you know, around people and strangers and kids, that's always been number one priority for me. And, and I've done, you know, pretty well in that area. But this is one of the things that I'm very big on, and that's space. One of the things that I do not allow is my dogs or client dogs invading my space. And this is something that we see people, do. I see trainers doing it all the time, you know? We tend to look at things from the human perspective and very rarely see things from the dog's perspective, right? But in the dog world, Using space is really, really important in their world, okay? Everything's done through body language. They're not talking to each other. Everything is, is body communication, body language, and space, using that space is really, really important, you know? One of the things, the example that you guys have, have heard me use a million times, but sorry, but it's, it's simple, but it's reality. It's what I do is when, you know, even with Bruno, my old Rottweiler, who, you know, was extremely well-behaved and a really good dog, even in that situation, I always tell people, if I was laying on the couch and he would get up and come over to me and drop his big, beautiful head on my chest, um... I wouldn't pet him, I wouldn't love on him, even though he didn't have issues, you know, because it's something that I really believe in. I would say, Bruno, go. And he would turn around and he would go, and he'd walk away and he'd go lay down in the kitchen. And when he lay down, I would say, Bruno, come here. And then he would come over because I called him into my space and then I would love on him, okay? Because even though he doesn't have behavior problems and he's a very trustworthy dog, I think it's still real important to be consistent with that dynamic inside the household to never send mixed messages to the dogs, okay? And so with him coming over and dropping his head on me, the way I see that, all right, and you may not, but the way I see it is, hey, you, pet me, now I'm here. And I just can't allow that, guys. I've always had big, powerful dogs, shepherds and Rottweilers mostly. And I have young children, and my children were really young when we had a lot of these dogs. And so it was really important to me that I build that dog that we want, that can be self-sufficient once it hits around that two-year old age mark inside the home. And these are the little things that are very important. So I don't allow dogs to invade my space. Same thing with my wife and my kids. They get that, you know. Renzo's 10 now. He's not that little, you know. But even uh, if a client's dog comes up and invades his space, he's very good about sending the dog away or stepping toward him and using that spatial pressure, which I use a lot. It's very, very effective, guys, and dogs get it, you know. And so when dogs invade our space, you know, that is, if you allow that over and over, I just think, I truly believe that that level of respect in you, it's going to be very hard to achieve what you want if that dog is always dictating what's going on, you know? And, and again, that's just me. That's the way I see things, guys. You know, I'll give you another example. A few years back, 
there was a dog training club that asked me to go down to Nashville and meet them at a dog park. I don't do dog parks, okay? I hate dog parks. I don't, I ask my clients not to go to dog parks, but a bunch of them were getting together at the local dog park and they asked me to come down and just, just watch what goes on and see if I can give them any tips to help them with their dogs. So I said, sure. There was a few vets there from the area and everything. And we got to talking, you know, we were watching the dogs and we were talking about different things going on. And then at one point, a, a big shepherd walked in, you know, and he wasn't part of that group. He was with someone else. Big shepherd walked in, you know, the tail was really held high, head was held really high, and he came in on a mission. And within 10 seconds, I told people, I said, if someone starts a fight here in a few minutes, it's going to be that dog. And they said, why? I said, well, just look what he's doing. You know, the way he carried himself in, extremely confident, you know? And he was looking for a challenge. And what he would do is he would approach every dog that came his way and he would come into their space and stand there and kind of challenge them. And every dog would turn around and back up and walk away. They would give him that space. You know, that dog was claiming that space. And uh, most of them gave it up without any issues. And that's all he wanted until finally one dog decided, I'm not giving this space up. You know, and he approached that dog and that dog kind of looked at him sideways and stared at him. And when he came a little closer to that shepherd and that dog didn't back up, boom, there it happened. You know, and uh, some of the people were like, I don't understand. How did you see that before it happened? Well, it, it was anyone can see it. You know what I mean? It was very, very simple. That dog came in looking to claim space on everyone. And the first dog that didn't give it up, there was a fight, you know, and uh, it wasn't real nasty. The dog proved his point real quick and, and, and that was it. I tried to help the people out and talk to them a little, but they, they weren't having it. They can, they can care less, you know what I mean? So that's just another example of a dog using space to get what, what he wants, you know? Um, another example that I've, you guys have heard me use a ton of times is, you know, Renzo was just a baby, you know, it could barely walk. And um, if he was walking into the kitchen and, and Bear or Bruno, that was my German Shepherd Bear, if one of those dogs were laying in the walkway going to the kitchen, my kids know at a very young age, they're not allowed to step over those dogs, okay? That's not the dog's space. That's our space, all right? We don't accommodate the dog. The dog has to accommodate us. So even at two years old, when, when he was just walking, you know, Renzo knew to kind of talk however he could at the time and tell Bear to move. And Bear would get up and he'd walk away and Renzo would say, thank you. But see, that's very powerful in the dog's eyes, guys. Now, if I allow my kids to step over that dog, what's that telling the dog? For me, it's telling the dog that's his space, okay? You have to go around because I'm not moving. And to create that behavior that I want, long lasting for the whole dog's life after around that two year old mark. These are the little things that I put all the effort into, okay? Obedience training, that's dessert, that's great. You know, I do it, I enjoy it now. I used to not even enjoy it, you know, but um, that's a small part of it. You know, 24 hours a day, how you live with that dog, in my opinion, is what creates what you want or don't want, you know? So that's, that's just a, a, another example. I use a ton of spatial pressure. Okay, a ton of spatial pressure. So even with the client's dog here, if I'm doing a board and train, the majority of the corrections I give are verbal and spatial pressure. You know, using my hands to clap and move toward that dog with, with energy and, and force and a deliberate look on my face sends a very good message to the dog and they get it. You know, they get it very, very well. Another thing is, you know, an example of there, if I'm playing tug with a dog or I'm playing ball and, you know, especially if it's a strong dominant dog and I put that ball on the ground and that dog's allowing me to take it, he's not fighting me for it, I will still practice moving that dog away. And I show my clients this all the time. I want to dictate how close that dog can get to the ball or the tug or whatever that dog wants at that moment. The food, it doesn't matter, you know, but that's sending a signal to that dog, not only is this object that you want right now mine, I'm allowing you to play with it or have it, but all that space around it is also mine. I can't talk tonight, is also mine. And so the dogs, and they the beautiful thing is guys, they get it, they get it so easily, you know what I mean? We talk about thresholds all the time. 
the doorway thing isn't so important to me because I just don't want my dog going out of the door first. If you see my dogs now, my, my own dogs that are trained, I don't care if they, they run in and out of dogs like lunatics. I don't stop them. I don't care. But during that training process, I do. And that's very important to me. And that's something that I work on clients with a lot. You know, um, the, the seminars in Australia and stuff, we really focused on that a lot with certain dogs where the owners were really struggling. But again, when that door goes open, that first instinct is for that dog to take off. It's not about going through the door first, but it's about getting the dog to back up without ever saying anything. To me, that's very powerful. Um, I don't use commands. I don't ask the dog to sit or down or stand, none of that. I don't care, I don't care what the dog does. The less verbalization, as far as I'm concerned, the better. We talk too much, we have to stop talking so much. You know, I talk a lot right now, right? I don't need to do so much with the dogs. So when that door opens, the first thing I'm going to do if that dog goes to move, I might bump him with my leg and then back him up with some spatial pressure and the dogs get it. You know, most of them go right along with it immediately and when you show a client that guys a new client especially especially with a dog that refuses to wait at the door and is really tough when they see the dog respond to that where you can create an invisible line there's nothing there but using your body spatial pressure in your hands to back the dog to where you want to it's very very powerful for the dog but it's even more powerful for the owners because showing them something is the easiest way to get them to believe in what you're doing, okay? So I find that very, very powerful. Listen, um, I don't have a water bowl in my house for the dogs. It's in the garage because between Buddy with his long doodle hair, it's a, uh, you wouldn't believe the mess when they drinks, but Luca does almost everything 110% extremely, extremely intense, right? About the only thing he does normally is eat. He's not an insane eater. He eats fast, but not overly fast, you know? But when he drinks, if I don't control his water intake, he'll drink, no matter how big the bowl is, he will drink it straight down. And he don't drink like a dog. You ever see the slow motion thing that they do with the German Shepherd that show how a dog drinks? Luca doesn't do that. His whole face goes into the water bowl and he gulps it and eats it and he will drink a whole bowl and then throw it up all over the place. So I have to even dictate how much or how long I can let him drink water, okay? So now when he hits that water bowl and he runs to it fast, always, he starts drinking very hard. If I just say, that's enough, Luca, He's always going to try to sneak in one or two more big gulps. And that may be enough to send him over the top and throw it up, right? But if I clap my hands and move toward him, even if I'm on the other side of the garage, instantaneously he stops. As soon as he sees me that I'm serious and I take that step toward him, he stops. But if I was to just yell, knock it off, that's enough, whatever. No more, whatever I say to him, you know what I mean? He'll sneak in one or two more gulps, but that spatial pressure going towards him, it lets him know, I'm dead serious, man. You have to step away from that. You know, it's really, really important, guys. Really important. Um, but back to the thing when a client gets out of the car with the dog. This, we all see as dog trainers, right? When a client's standing there with their dog on a leash, you see so many of these dogs, they're going in every direction, right? Just trying to get away and create some distance. Here, the dog is trying to create distance and separate himself for the owner. There's just not much intention there. There's no desire to be with the owner at the owner's side, right? For me, the only time I want my dogs or my client's dogs doing that is when they're released, free dog or whatever you use. When you do that, do what you want, okay? So sometimes when I get a dog that's really bad with that and we're dealing with behavioral issues, sometimes I don't get down my driveway for 20 minutes. I've been down there for 30 minutes before I can get a dog to settle in because what happens is when I take the leash from the owner, I'm not going to allow that dog to do that. But sometimes the dog's been doing this for years, right? If he's on the leash, he's not relaxed. He's going this way, he's going that way, nose is to the ground, very anxious, very antsy, looking around, doesn't care who has the leash. I'm not going to move forward when the dog's in that state of mind. So what I do is I stand there and um, I think 
I did this, I have a lot of video maybe with Emmy, the big great Dane when she first got here. Um, you know, really important, you know, and I did a ton of videos with her so you guys can see when we picked her up at the airport to the minute we got home because I find that stuff really important for people. But again, that's just me. So when that dog's pulling away from me, all I'm going to do, I'm not giving corrections, I'm not saying anything, I'm not giving commands, I'm not using food, I'm not using tools. I'm gonna just pull that dog back with the leash and when it's next to me, I let go and relax, okay? What's gonna happen at least a few more times is the dog's going to try to walk away again. As the dog walks away, I bring it back to me. I'm controlling the space. I'm not gonna allow the dog to dictate that space and create space away from me, okay? It's not going to happen. So the dog walks away, I bring it back. Again, no commands, I'm not saying anything. And what's always gonna happen, guys, and this happens every single time, eventually, one of two things usually happens. Either the dog will sit and look at me, that's acceptable. When the dog gives me that, then I move down the driveway, all right? Um, the other thing is, a lot of times the dog will just stop and lay down. Same thing, that's what I want. I want the dog either to sit and give me eye contact, like, well, what do you want? Then we'll move. Or if the dog just lays down and gives up, like, okay, I understand, you're in charge now, I'm with you. You know, then I can move forward. But that's really important to me, guys. And so that leash, for me, that's still the most important dog training tool we have. That leash is your translator. It tells the dog what you want, and it's your GPS. It shows the dog where you want it. Really, really important, you know? I'm trying to think of, of what else here, you know? Um, but I think that's about, about most of it here. I'm trying to see, I actually made notes to talk about this because I want to start giving more specific information for the questions that you guys answer. And so when people want examples, let's focus on that one thing. For you folks that I talked to today, several of you, focus on that one thing. Pay attention to the space. Pay attention to how your dog is using the space and pay attention to how you're using space. Are you using it to your advantage or aren't you? You know, probably the dog's using it to his advantage. So creating that space is really, really important to me, guys, you know, and I'm, I can't have the dog invade my space and dictate the distance, the movement, all of those little things that we tend to overlook. Uh, to me, it's a game changer. It really is. And I think it's one of the first things that you, you have to understand and accomplish before you go any further. You, you know what I mean? Just really important. But I think if a lot of you guys start implementing that and start paying attention to it, you know? Remember, those doorways and stuff, it's about you claiming that space without talking to the dog and without giving commands. You know, use your body if you have to. Use the spatial pressure. Don't block the dog. Give him the room. We want to offer him the room to go. The real magic happens when all the room is there and you could just snap your fingers and move towards the dog and the dog backs up like, oh, okay, that's yours. That space is as valuable as food or a toy in most cases. So try to take advantage of it. I'm trying to think if there's anything uh, that I forgot here. And I don't think there, I don't think there is, you know, um, but that's it. A few examples. It's a, it's a little long, a little dry but I'm gonna to try to be better about giving more examples um, because unfortunately, when I make a video and we talk about something, a lot of times I'm thinking that the people watching or asking questions have seen all the other videos or, or the things I believe in or said before, and that's not always the case, you know? So uh, I had someone on YouTube today make a comment. It was a very negative comment and people kind of jumped on him and said he has like 500 other videos you could watch. They're like, oh, this was the first one I ever saw. So I'm starting to, I understand that sometimes if people just think, hey, that's the only video this guy has, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm gonna try to be better about making the information a lot more clear, not assuming that everyone knows who I am and my belief system and, and what I do. And again, this information mostly pertains to the average dog owner that knows very, very little and is struggling out there. Focus on the space, start controlling it on both ends, and I could promise you, you're going to see a difference very quickly, okay folks? Peace.